Now, moving on to our second session, digital innovation for financial inclusion, leveraging technology to reach the underserved and the unbanked. This session will look at successful business models of digital innovation for greater financial exclusive inclusivity. Our first panelist for this session is Peter Franken. Peter's career spans over 25 years in financial services, specializing in ONT fintech, innovation, and large-scale transformations. He's held C-level and executive positions with industry leaders such as Citigroup, Shinsei Bank, A+, Monarch Securities, and the Monarchs Group. His hallmark is pioneering innovative services by embracing bleeding edge technologies while minimizing time to market and dramatically reducing costs. He is well versed in large scale IT transformation, bimodal management, innovation, software development, data center operations, financial operations, and fintech. Peter, the stage is yours. Thank you, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, just allow me to share my screen and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm uh, humbled by what you said. Uh, today I'm representing uh, the APEX initiative and I'm going to talk about and quickly introduce that and how that is relevant to you. Uh, so here we are and this is New York, but uh, we can very quickly switch between locations these days. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, before before talking about uh, before talking about uh, uh, Apex, uh, you know the previous session really highlighted the challenges that we're seeing in digitization of our industries, and I'm going to talk about the financial industry, and specifically how that plays into financial inclusion. And uh, when we started our journey, we interviewed many banks and fintechs across Asia to find out how are things going. And of course, everybody hears about fintech and whatever. But the untold story is, is that when a fintech tries to uh, sell new technologies to a bank, the process to actually do the sales is extremely slow. It is very common to spend a year to two years on actually doing a POC followed by implementation and then finally going production. And there's all kinds of reasons for why this is so slow. And I don't want to go into much details, but there's a lot of confusion about what the regulators are saying and what people are hearing from the regulators about innovation these days. And people tend to actually take kind of a too conservative view of, of things in my mind. Uh, the other thing that is happening is, is that the processes and thinking, and we talked about it in the previous session, are way outdated in, in the banking industry. Uh, you know, mainframes uh, were with us 30 years ago. They're still with us, but it comes with a lot of, lot of, lot of luggage and, and overhead that really is not needed with the current technologies. So we really have a huge skill gap. We also have a mind, mindset gap, and we have a problem around how we perceive the regulations and what we actually can do. And of course, this plays very much into, uh, into the problem when banks are trying to use new technology. And when we talk about banks, we're not talking about the big banks. We're also talking about rural banks or credit associations, all kind of financial institutions. So, so if you if you look at this uh, uh, pipeline, uh, you know, though sometimes it takes literally weeks to build something, we easily will spend a year talking about it. So, how do we break out of that cycle? Was really the 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 initiative or the, the thinking behind Apex, and how do we do this? Because you know, if we look at what is, you know, what, what is kind of the problem if you look this from, from, from a distance, right? If we talk about financial inclusion, you know, really what it is about is that a financial institution must lower the cost of manufacturing their products because financial inclusion means smaller accounts, smaller margins. So your, your production cost has to come down dramatically in order to be sustainable, right? And that is needed to reach underserved and emerging customer segments, right? Customers have already gone digital, right? Most developed, develop, developing markets in Asia, the penetration of mobile technology is 100%. Not everything is smartphone, okay? But the penetration is very, very high. While access to financial services is less than 30%. There is a huge gap. Non-financial institutions are disrupting finance for, for the micro SME market with digital only low cost offerings. Right, so we have fintechs that help financial institutions. There's also fintechs that are the disruptors. They're using the new technology to move really fast. Most incumbents and rural banks and financial institutions are not digital. Uh, they may have nothing or they may have very outdated equipment. If they don't go digital, they will become irrelevant. This is very important uh, to understand. Though fintechs can play a critical role, it's proven you know, we, we have to break through the speed barrier of working together. 
So, so if, if we think about the incumbents as driving a trabant, and if, if, if you don't know what a trabant is, it's like kind of a, uh, it's kind of a tuk-tuk or something of the, of the East, East Germany. And they're basically Germany, yeah. trying to get yeah. their, they're trying to get their mainframes to go faster. Now that's okay, as everybody drives a trabant, there is no problem. But what happens if, if N Financial or, or Facebook or, or whatever starts to do financial services, they're driving Teslas and they're really fast and nifty cars, very, very, very. Uh, very advanced. So this is what the disruptors are looking like. And then when we think about fintechs trying to help the incumbents, this is what happens. They basically run into a wall of time and slowness. So the innovation is really not going to happen very quickly. And that is very sad because the technology today, I've spent near 30 years in this industry, is really very different from what it was five years ago or 10 years ago. We can go very fast. The Tesla has reached our, our, uh, our era, the era of, of the old combustion engine is really behind us, but not in the streets, not in the banks that we see today. So what happened is, is that uh, this, this phenomena became apparent to, uh, to, to the regulators in Singapore, who, as you may know, have been trying to kind of break out of this, this, this logjam by, by trying to be as innovative as possible. So the MIS in Singapore and the, in the IFC part of the World Bank got together and they got together with the ASEAN Banker Association and said, we must do something to help our banks to go faster. How can we create something that will help them to go over these, these uh, uh, through this speed barrier? So, and that created the ASEAN Financial in, uh, in Innovation Network and that, that network basically built what is now known as the Apex platform. And what is the Apex platform? It's basically, I'm going to keep it really simple because in the interest of time, but basically think of it as of, of a magic where we take the Trabant and we turn it into Teslas by using fintech technology. And so, you know, the, the, as I said, I keep it really simple here. But, but the whole idea here is, is to basically help the banks to move fast. So... I'm going to talk for two seconds a little bit more technically what it actually is. And you're more than welcome to visit the platform. You can learn more about it. But basically, uh, it is a marketplace, first of all, for banks to find fintechs. But that's not the only thing because finding is for many banks is a problem and a challenge because banks don't know what to trust. You know, is this okay or not? How do, how do I, you know, how do I communicate? So finding is one problem. But the, the other thing is, is how do you quickly use the technology? So on the platform, all these fintechs, published so-called APIs. APIs are kind of uh, a special language that allows you to connect things together. So, uh, uh, and with that, you can kind of very quickly build up complex systems. So instead of writing code, you write connectors between big things of code. So, so these APIs are on the platform and people can come there and actually use them on the platform in the cloud right there. So you can actually build your prototypes or your ideas in Apex with your programmers very quickly. And we talked about the skill gap. Uh, the, the, we have done workshops, et cetera, with programmers that have never done this. It takes about a day or two days to get a, a programmer that has done some work before to be proficient on here. So it really is exciting for programmers because suddenly they can use all these APIs that they were dreaming of and they can start stitching things together. Uh, it also has a way for banks to post problem statements. People can respond to it. We also built a whole kind of hackathon site module on it so that you can host a hackathon and kind of invite people to come and help you fix, you know, fix, fix your problems and come up with ideas. Um, so what are these APIs now? So, so these APIs are covering many different types of capabilities like know your customer, AML, lending options, point to point lending, analytics, uh, blockchain, cybersecurity, rec tech, sub tech, whatever. So there's a wide variety on the platform. We have uh, I think over 300 fintechs that are currently fully registered, and we have about thousand and a library of thousand fintechs to ch to choose from. So, so this gives you kind of a huge Lego, you know, box with Lego blocks to start assembling things. Uh, so, so as you know, as we were talking about the skill gap, right? Instead of instead of writing COBOL, you basically are using APIs instead, and APIs are basically like big functionalities that you put together. So it's, there's a massive speed up in that. So one, one line of code suddenly is a whole application. And sometimes we talk about know your 
customer KYC. But you know, with blockchain technology, you you can find fintechs that have come up with know your cow, and this is being done in 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 areas in Africa where where small farmers can use blockchain to uniquely identify their cattle and use that to get they use it as collateral in lending. So there's a tremendous amount of innovation happening out there that is mind blowing, and you can through Apex you can get access to that. Uh, before I close, uh, very quickly, uh, for you know, for specifically for the Philippines, there's a lot of financial institutions that are looking to go digital, and we're having active discussions with various parties to see how we can help in that. And one of the things that we are actively working on is to say, can we come up with a pre-assembled mini financial? Uh, platform or core platform that's kind of already pre-assembled. So instead of you assembling it, it's kind of a pre-assembled and it's called Go Apex. Uh, you can visit that to see kind of what it looks like conceptually. But this is basically the idea to say, okay, you want to go digital instead of you making the choices. We can, we have already come up with a, a set of, of choices. You need to kind of customize it for your needs, but you can start from, from a, you know, from, from a very Good starting position. So it's kind of basically, you know, getting getting is you know getting the Tesla. And you need to just decide the color and how many seats and stuff like that. And this is what technology can do today. We're really reaching a state, and this that's made possible by cloud computing. It's made possible by the uh, by the internet. It's making made possible by customers already having access to the internet through their mobile phones. So here I would like to stop, and I would urge you to come and visit us or contact me or any of my colleagues if you want to learn more. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Peter. Interesting analogies, and we'll take them back later in terms of how that transformation can actually happen in terms of a last mile delivery solution, especially here in the Philippines and other developing economies. Um, our next panelist is Ellen Joyce Sufiensha. She is the director of the Financial Inclusion Group Center for Learning and Inclusion Advocacy, or CLIA, of the Banco Central in Filipinas. Joyce is deeply involved in various initiatives to drive the BSP's financial inclusion agenda forward. She handles policy development and advocacy work. <coughs> with particular focus on inclusive digital finance, MSMEs, and agriculture financing. Joyce, good morning. Hello, uh, good morning. Good morning, Kintin, and to the rest of the audience. Uh, first of all, allow me to thank the ABAC uh, for giving BSP this opportunity uh, to discuss our financial inclusion initiatives to your uh, network. Um, Forms like this is very important for our work as we secure broad-based support for financial inclusion in the country. And it's also an opportunity for, for me personally to learn from, um, from the previous uh, speakers before me. Very interesting. So let me start by giving you a snapshot of the state of financial inclusion in the country. So just briefly, uh, allow me to define financial inclusion. Um, we define it in the BSP as a state where every Filipino has access to welfare enhancing financial services. The BSP actually conducts a biennial financial inclusion survey, which uh, measures financial inclusion from an individual's perspective. And uh, just in uh, July this year, we released the results of the 2019 financial inclusion survey and uh, we found the results very encouraging. Our headline indicator for financial inclusion is of course ownership of a financial account. That's a basic um, tool for uh, being considered financially included. And we're happy to report that from just 23% uh, in 2017, account ownership grew to 29% in two years. Uh, that's equivalent to an additional 5 million Filipinos onboarded in that two-year period. We also want to highlight uh, the phenomenal growth of account ownership among the poorest, which doubled from just 14% in 2017, uh, well below the national average at, um, in that year to 2017, uh, to 27% in 2019. Uh, that significantly outpaced the growth of the national average and other income groups. This has dramatically narrowed the account ownership gap among the richest and the poorest. Among account types, the biggest gainer we see is the e-money accounts, which grew by 7 percentage point from just 1% in 2017 to 8% in 2019. And consistent with the rise uh, of e-money is the increase in account holders uh, who use digital payments, which more than doubled to 39% in 2019. We also see a growth in the uptake of other financial services, 
such as formal credit, insurance, and investments. Despite this commendable growth, we of course recognize that much remains to be done as 70% of our adult Filipinos still don't have an account. The top cited reasons for not owning an account uh, are not really a surprise. Uh, it's lack of enough money, lack of need for an account, and lack of documentary requirements. And that is why in promoting account ownership, we realize it's not enough that we make opening an account easy and affordable. We also need to make sure that an account is actually perceived as valuable, um, that it can be used not only for saving extra money, which most people say they don't have, but that they can use it for basic transactions, including um, payments. And that is why digital payment and financial inclusion uh, really go hand in hand. And the potential of uh, digital technology as drivers of financial inclusion has long been widely recognized. And if you look at the next slide, uh, we find from our survey that while we have a relatively high mobile phone and internet access penetration, these digital assets are underutilized for financial transactions. In fact, seven in 10 unbanked adults have a mobile phone which we see as an untapped opportunity for digital finance. To us, uh, this highlights two main uh, challenges in advancing digital finance. The first is uh, financial and digital literacy. The main reasons that were cited in the survey for the low usage of online and mobile financial transactions are lack of awareness and trust. Another challenge is the digital divide in terms of gaps in smartphone ownership and internet access. Our survey showed rural, rural areas, uh, regions outside Metro Manila, and those who belong to lower uh, socioeconomic groups are disproportionately disadvantaged. As we can see, internet penetration in Mindanao is not even half of that in Metro Manila. So BSP's financial inclusion efforts um, are also not con only confined to the access needs of individual Filipinos, uh, which we uh, showed, uh, uh, which we monitor uh, through our financial inclusion survey, as uh, I previously re uh, reported. BSP recognizes that for financial inclusion to really drive inclusive growth, we also need to focus on the financing needs of the MSME sector, given their outsized role in providing employment and sources of income to a significant number of Filipinos. However, even prior to the pandemic, MSMEs have consistently cited access to finance as uh, one of the top barriers to their development and competitiveness. Banking sector statistics also show a declining trend in MSME lending as a percentage of the bank's total loan portfolio. We have uh, actually anticipated that this challenge will further exacerbate as a result of the pandemic. The MSME sector has been among the hardest hit. Based on a survey conducted a few weeks into the ECQ, more than 60% reported MSME respondents reported to have stopped operations and to have um, incurred zero sales. Lack of working capital figured prominently as an immediate concern. But there could be a silver lining, especially for MSMEs with online presence, as a significant share of consumers started making more online purchases and with a forecast and e-commerce revenue growth hitting 42% this year. The estimated number of e-commerce users is also at 39 million in 2020, which is quite a sizable market. As the pandemic kicked in, BSP was quick to issue a series of time-bound regulatory reliefs and incentives to ensure banks do not completely turn their back, back, backs away from MSMEs and to further stimulate financing for MSMEs, especially at the time when it was most needed. New MSME loans were considered as part of bank's reserve requirement compliance. We also reduced risk weight for MSME, MSME loans to as low as 50% and assigned zero risk weights to MSME and agri loans covered by the government's guarantee programs, including by the Agriculture Credit Policy Council. 
these COVID-related policy measures have freed up additional bank liquidity that, uh, that were channeled to MSME financing. And we saw positive results and response from the banking sector. New MSME loans amounting to 40 billion have been generated during the ECQ based on survey of the top 30 banks. Existing MSME loans amounting to 25 billion were also renewed while 1.8 billion were restructured. MSME loans used for compliance with reserve requirements has climbed to 120 billion from just 1.7 billion in 120 billion in October from just 1.7 billion in April when this compliance mechanism was first introduced. But BSP's efforts to support uh, MSME financing go beyond the regulatory relief measures. BSP aims to shape a sustainable ecosystem that facilitates meaningful participation from the banking sector. By meaningful participation, we mean that banks uh, go into MSME financing not because of mandatory credit requirement, but because they really see the MSME sector as a strategic and viable market segment. And BSP has therefore undertaken a series of initiatives that aim to develop the necessary market infrastructure to improve banks credit risk assessment and management tools as well as bridge information asymmetries that uh, prevent banks from lending to smaller firms or make banks heavily reliant on the use of collateral. And this is the rationale behind the key initiatives of the BSP, BSP for MSME financing. These initiatives include the credit risk database project that we are undertaken, undertaking with um, JICA's assistance and CRD aims to build a statistical scoring model to support banks' assessment of the probability of default of an SME borrower. BSP also continues to support the development of credit surety fund cooperatives, or the CSF. CSF program is actually a credit enhancement scheme which provides maximum 80% surety coverage for loans granted by banks to contributing MSMEs and their cooperatives. BSP is also working on the design and conduct of a national uh, MSME demand side survey, which aims to generate better and more granular data on the profile and needs of MSMEs to inform targeted interventions as well as to support uh, the financial service providers market research. Another initiative in the pipeline is the conduct of a study in partnership with a global expert for the development of the supply chain financing market in the country. Uh, we in the BSP recognize the potential of supply chain finance as an innovative approach to support access to bank financing of smaller firms who may lack credit history or are deemed high risk. These are just some of the initiatives that are specifically being pursued by BSP to support MSME financing. But we recognize that an underlying enabler for innovative MSME financing is the digital infrastructure. So allow me now to share uh, BSP's broad strategy for digitalization in support of uh, digital payments and financial inclusion the government has uh, the governor has made public pronouncements of the BSP's bold targets by 2023 to onboard at least 70% of adult Filipinos to an account and to bring the share of digital payments in terms of transaction volume to 50%. These are the measurable outcomes envisioned in our three-year digital payments transformation roadmap. The roadmap also acknowledges the strategic importance of consumer data, not only as something that needs to be protected, but also that can be harnessed in a way that maximizes the benefits for the financial consumers. To achieve these outcomes, the roadmap identifies three pillars that serve as the backbone of an inclusive digital payments ecosystem. The first is the digital payment stream, where, which aims to promote payment use cases of accounts and shift cash-based payment transactions to digital payments, particularly for paying bills and merchants, as well as government fees and taxes. 
The next pillar is a digital finance infrastructure, uh, which is essentially the regulatory framework and platforms that facilitate um, scale and reach of digital financial services. One of the key pieces of this infrastructure is the Philippine IT system, which is our digital, our national digital IT system. The third pillar is data governance and standards, which aim to promote responsible and strategic use of digital assets by BSP supervised entities for the optimal benefit of financial system and the transacting public, of course. So the, this uh, transformation roadmap actually builds on the foundations of inclusive digital finance that BSP has started to put in place in the last four years. And that includes the introduction of the low cost transaction accounts uh, through the basic deposit account guidelines, uh, as well as the expansion of the cash in and cash out points through our agent banking regulation. And lastly, the interoperable digital payment trails uh, via Instapay and Pesonet, which were created under the National Retail Payment System Framework. And um, we can no longer talk about the new economy and the new normal without talking about the digital imperatives. The pandemic has thrusted upon us the opportunity to shape a new economy powered by, by digital. But if we're not careful and deliberate, the benefits of this transition to digital could be an even certain segments of the population may be further excluded. So we think that financial inclusion in the new economy uh, really demands adequate digital infrastructure, especially to make internet connectivity widely available and affordable. BSP is actually advocating for policy reform to fast track the expansion of internet infrastructure in areas uh, unserved or poorly served by incumbent internet providers. Another is the FILSIS, uh, which we hope to be implemented soon. Uh, this will provide every Filipino a digital ID and enable financial institutions to perform seamless, cost-efficient um, EKYC. Consumers need digital skills as well as a prerequisite for them to effectively and safely use digital financial services. And lastly, we need to continuously promote an enabling regulatory environment for innovative digital solution. BSP's proposed digital banking licensing framework and open banking are two regulatory initiatives um, worth highlighting. The creation of digital banking license is envisioned to attract innovative market players who have a strong digital play and can inject dynamism into the digital finance space uh, that will ultimately benefit uh, the consumers and MSMEs. These um, digital imperatives are embedded in the digital payments transformation roadmap of the BSP. Um, I will end my presentation with this slide, which attempts to convey an envisioned future for financial inclusion built on a consented data sharing regime facilitated by regulations for open banking or open data, as some would call it. Our goal is to shape an ecosystem that facilitates responsible sharing of customer transaction data to unlock access to a suite of well-designed financial services. We envision financial institutions able and compelled to deliver data-informed products that are hyper-tailored to the needs and context of the consumers with the end goal, of course, of delivering optimum consumer value. In this future, for instance, a small business owner with no credit history and no collateral can access a tailored loan product from a bank based on his cash flow, payment transactions, and activities in e-commerce and other digital platforms. This future will not happen overnight but we in the BSP are committed to take the necessary steps toward achieving this envisioned safe. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director Joyce. I uh, really appreciate the BSP's role as well. I mean, I, as someone who moderated the panel at the, the BSP FinTech Summit, I take note really that your sandbox approach has really helped innovation in the sector with the public and private sector. And on that note, I'd like to call Peter in so we can have his discourse in terms of where to take this innovation to make those ambitious targets uh, happen and, and, and to meet and fulfill inclusivity in the financial sector, uh, especially for the poorest of the poor. 
Uh, Peter, uh, you can uh, please join us. And uh, now that you're on board, um, let's let's begin. I think one thing to notice since that uh, landmark uh, forum that the uh, the BSP governor had, had uh, keynoted uh, when he first came on board was really more how the convergence of the fintech sector is, is moving, the dynamics of it. And what we're seeing from an industry perspective is you're seeing banks turning into fintech companies to, to, to really scale up and also manage the disruption, but also even telco companies acting like banks. There's a lot of con convergence coming in. The BSP is in the middle helping that innovation and obviously developers and, and, and experts like yourself Peter, are there to see that process happen with the kind of content and products that are being relevant for the players for exclusivity. So the, with that, the question I have is, how do you really move the needle in terms of getting that, you know, the last mile delivery, uh, the, the most marginalized into a developing country uh, set of targets? Like, for example, you know, to get it up to 70%, uh, in terms of banked, people who have bank accounts or who are banked, and at the same time, 50% of the transaction. What, what will move the needle from, from a developer's perspective and a private sector best practice perspective? Peter, can you share with us? Yeah. Yes, so it's a, it's a very good question, and I, I have to apologize. I don't think I'll have the perfect answer for it at 70%. It's a huge challenge. I think that uh, Joyce spoke about all the challenges that the Philippines has, and the goal is, I think, is very aggressive, but is right. You have to, you know, a lot of things have to happen. I think you can't do it top down. You have to go bottoms up because a lot of infrastructure is needed to reach out to these customers. And we're talking about the Philippines, you know, the numbers are, you know, 30, 40 million people need to be reached, et cetera, et cetera. So you can't do that by, by top down. You have to look at what the infrastructure is on the ground and everybody will have to play their bit to do the lending, to open up the accounts, et cetera. So this is where we're trying to help by providing kind of a shortcut Kind of cheating, so to speak, uh, to say how can you how can you get your you know how can you digitize faster, and uh, and and in that space there is a lot of challenges for financial institutions etc cetera, etc cetera, to do so, but there is a lot of there is a lot of uh, empirical experience that has been built up over the last years that can be shared, and there is a lot of fintechs that are ready to help, and sometimes that may be hard to find. But I think we can make that much easier. We're not the only ones doing that, but across Asia, et cetera, we're rather unique in trying to pull that together and bring that to every uh, Asian nation. So this is one, one area. I think the other area is when you go a little bit more into the kitchen, so to speak, of the bank, I think there is a lot of uh, need to go digital. I, when I talk to various people uh, in the Philippines over the last, little over the last 10 days or so, you know, the, it's everybody knows we must do something. But now the question is how do we do it? Who's going to provide capacity building? Who's going to provide the technology and the ideas? So I think there is still a lot of discussion to be done to say, how can we do it? And I think we also have to go and see some initial use cases. Unfortunately, some of the digital uh, uh, early dig digitization uh, efforts, not only in the Philippines, but we see that everywhere have been not very successful. And it has a lot to do with, I think, still too much, uh, uh, too much baggage of the past in terms of how do we innovate and too much... Uh, uh, too much big steps. You know, you need to make smaller steps, try to get one thing going. And there are different techniques and strategies that the bank can employ to get there. Uh, in, many, in some cases, I see people do strategies like, this is the hardest way possible to get to digital. Why don't you do it like this? Or why don't you have to thought about this? And I think a lot of sharing there can help people to get, oh, okay, is that possible? Yes, that's possible. But what about the regulators? Well, I think your regulator would be very happy if you would go and go digital because they have all these aggressive targets. Don't you think that, you know, and I think that dialogue between regulators, technology, banks, etc., needs to kind of become more pragmatic and say, you know, we have to get this going and we have to take some risks. So if we look at the Apex platform, and I'm going to stop here for, for a moment, but if you look at that, what we're trying to do is to really make it clear that you can start building right away and build something together. As you do that, you'll discover if it was 100% right or not, you can make quick uh, quick adjustments. Uh, some people may say, oh, but, you know, I need to figure that out up front. No, you don't have to. You can start building right away. You figure out what it is. Once you have kind of, hey, this is kind of working, then you, you put in more capacity to make it production, right? So there's more work needed, et cetera. But the initial phase should happen really, really fast. And that builds confidence for the bank and the management to say, hey, we can do this. Oh, this is how it works. Oh, that wasn't that hard. Oh, wow, these people are out there. This can actually be put together very quickly. And so, so that confidence building will then 
you know, get you toward the last, we call it kind of the last mile, but the last mile is not the hardest bit. It is really not wasting 12 to two, you know, one to two years, RFPs, proposals, what is the cheapest or whatever. It's all not relevant. You're on a big it's journey. And so you have, you know, there's 40 million people to be covered. So we don't have so much time. And the mistakes that most people make are not choosing the technology or doing the technology. The mistake is spending too much time thinking about it. Uh, because that opportunity, that opportunity to bring the solutions to the people in the field is really what it is all about. So I'm going to stop here and uh, give it back to you, Quinton. Yeah, thanks, Peter. I mean, certainly uh, a more fluid mindset, more progressive mindset that allows you shorter cycle times and, and allows you to do an iterative approach rather than something that is overthought rather yes. than uh, rather than practice and, and innovate along the way. It certainly helps. And I'm, I'm actually pretty much describing the BSP's sandbox experience in terms of looking at the innovations and, and, and seeing what works, right? So, Director Joyce, I wanted to check with you. I mean, you've been on top of this policy development and working with private sector players uh, for these innovations. What have you seen that can really help, so to speak, move the needle towards that 70% and 50% target? Yeah, um, I appreciate uh, Peter's response earlier, you know, um, it starts with, uh, we, of course, there are different, uh, we're confronting several fronts when it comes to our financial exclusion challenges. Uh, there's infrastructure challenges. We, we all know about the connectivity challenges. And if you want adoption, digital finance adoption, that starts with really providing internet connectivity to the unbanked, to the, you know, to these remote areas where most of the unbanked are reside. But on the supply side, the concern of banks, um, I think um, a lot of these uh, banks, especially the smaller banks uh, that we are hoping to and are really well positioned and driven by mission to serve the last mile, um, they are unfortunately uh, overwhelmed by the digital transformation requirements. And if there's any uh, positive, um, you know, a silver lining, we all know the silver lining to the pandemic, it's really, uh, you know, um, these smaller banks um, embracing and really seeing the urgency to adopt digital transformation. And um, they really have to also uh, face not only for these smaller banks, the first thing is they don't have, in, in fact, the existing infrastructure. Some of them don't have existing infrastructure. But for other banks, it's also contending with legacy infrastructure as well as legacy culture. Um, and smaller banks don't have access to uh, experts, IT experts. Those are scarce and um, expensive, especially in the Philippines. So um, those are some of the challenges uh, that they face. And for the BSP, we're trying to facilitate support for the rural banks uh, by channeling uh, uh, funding from development uh, agencies uh, to provide rural banks and microfinance institutions serving the last mile uh, the needed support, whether that's funding or technical assistance, to help them um, implement and design their digital transformation journey. Okay. Uh, thanks for that, Director Joyce. And I think just as a follow-up to uh, that question, when you talk about the last mile delivery, I mean, I've had uh, forums before with different banks, and, and one of the pain points they've identified is, is how to empower the rural banks. That, they, that infrastructure is there in the country. Certainly, Banco Central and, and, and other central banks around the world have oversight over those rural banks, and there's been some consolidation in the sector. How can the private sector and also the regulators come in and say, look, I mean, there's a very valid role for these rural banks to come in, and how do you speed up their digitization so that they can, you know, they can serve their publics better and still avoid this attrition that's happening in the sector? And, I, and that, that also goes for you, Peter, if you can answer that from a best practice perspective. Okay. Right yes, again, a very good question. I'm not sure I have the perfect answer for it again, but I'll try. And it's also one to uh, uh, reflect in, in on what Joyce was just saying about, you know, the, the, the reality is indeed, you know, you, you, what does the bank have? And where is that bank and what trajectory is a big deal? So each bank has, a, has its own little story and you can't just, uh, you know, one, one shoe fits all. Every bank that wants to go digital will have its own unique little starting point and but what I what it kind of a you know a kind of interesting observation maybe is is that from you know the way I look at things is that the bank that has nothing actually is better positioned than a bank that has something and the reason is is that legacy can be very 
uh, prohibitive in doing anything because you kind of you kind of anchored into something. So banks that have very very small infrastructure but have a vision, and and an, and a need can actually leapfrog because they can just leave everything behind, and start with an empty house and start populating the house rather than we have a half populated house and we don't know how to to go elsewhere. On the other hand, banks that do have a, uh, have legacy can do the same. If they're, if, you know, if we're in a growth market, as opposed to a market, you know, if you go look in US or Europe and some more of the, the advanced parts of Asia, it's a satirized market where most of the FinTech is being used to create efficiency or lower cost. That's all important. But I, th I think if we look at developing countries, it is about capacity building to get people to go and become banked. So the problem is very, very different. So, so a lot of the technology that, that people talk about is way too sophisticated actually to solve that problem. And we should not be bothered with it. We should say, can, can this thing be connected to ATMs? Can this thing be connected to payments? Can this thing be uh, used to book a loan? And if it does, you're more or less sure that you're 90% going to be successful. The key is, is that not to get distracted by all the endless amount of, of, of doubt is to just you know, go build it. You, you, the current technology, you, it's hard to make a real big mistake in terms of doing that. And, the, and we were talking about APIs. The beauty of that is, is that uh, as opposed to the mainframes where everything is custom integrated by, by artisan, artisans, that have chiseled that over the years, the new APIs, et cetera, allow you to actually replace a component over time. So it's it's like, you know, okay, we took this KYC uh, application. It was great when we started. Now we need something more sophisticated. Okay. Replacing that becomes not a big decision. So in other words, don't waste too much time thinking it all through. Make sure that what you have gets you, gets you started and then as you go, you can scale up and get more sophistic sophisticated in your in your thinking. So I think yeah. that is kind of an advice, you know, for 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 the rural banks to say that, you know, understand, don't look at the big banks. They're very sophisticated. You don't need that. You know, and and but you need immediate, you know, capabilities to start booking, connecting, and doing things. And then as you engage new customers, you start to learn as to what that means and what they're talking, and then you can start to to do things, but don't try to solve the whole puzzle up front up to, you know, up to a mega bank status. So, and that would be my advice real from, from pra practitioner viewpoint that that actually works. And that's kind of where AFIN is trying to, you know, as an MPO, we basically trying to bring you the shortcut, the cheat sheet, so to speak, to do that. Well, certainly with a digital imperative, you have to get the low hanging fruit, more importantly, try a modular approach. Yes. Isn't that something yes. where you have to turn the queen mary around so to speak now and director joyce i mean having you know seen that you know that the philippine financial system is only as good as its smallest players but the rural banks themselves do have a role in the certain provinces remote areas and how how's how is banco central helping them uh make that step make that leap into digitization yeah um there's actually a uh, an ongoing um, support from a French development agency uh, that's helping uh, to the rural banks, the rural partnering with the Rural Bankers Association in uh, supporting digitization efforts of the rural banks, and um, it's still at, at the conceptual stage. And this is something that BSP is also supporting. Um, I also appreciate what uh, Peter said about you know rural banks starting small and not getting overwhelmed by the whole digitization strategy. So I think uh, for us in the BSP, it's also important that we uh, support those conversations uh, with rural banks and vendors. You know, helping them mystify really uh, digital solutions for rural banks. There's a lot of demystification that needs to happen. Um, because all these talks about fintech sometimes overwhelm, you know, smaller banks who are not really used to talking to fintechs. And so, if we can have that uh, facilitate that um, productive dialogue and conversation between smaller banks, including the uh, microfinance institutions and uh, vendors, and all these solutions that have ready, uh, you know, ready solution, implementable solution for these types of institution, then. That's probably one way we can support it. Yeah, I and mean, certainly customization of the shelf type products will help because yeah. then it lowers it lowers the uh, the the friction in terms of getting that on board. Now, I, on that note, I did want to ask about you know the, this thing about trust. I mean, obviously, a lot of transition and migration, even if it's being pushed 
by this pandemic boils down to trust. Will the vendor want, will, 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 will an individual user want to put a digital wallet together when they're so used to having money in their hands, uh, especially, you know, in rural areas where that is, where, where that is the norm. Uh, and then you also look at, you know, uh, vendors out there who want to try this platform, but are worried about, you know, how do you build these KYC systems in there? How do you make sure your credit is paid? Um, tell us about uh, innovations that will allow people to overcome this trust. Uh, is a digital ID uh, system, you know, something that you have to wait for, or are there some interim solutions to, to work with as, as people make that journey and migrate to the journey? Peter and, and, and Director Garcia. Okay. Again, Quinton, I, I'm impressed with your questions. At every, every so far, all questions I can't perfectly answer. This is definitely a big challenge. That's why the dialogue is here. <laughs> and, and 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 you know we're here with the central bank, and you know, and, and this is a very big topic, obviously. So first of all, money is a very funny thing because you know uh, we talk about cash or digital currencies or whatever, but money is 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 inherently a trust system. Uh, the paper is just a manifestation of the trust we have between us to settle. And it has nothing to do with cash or digital or anything. First of all, you trust that your your money is 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 what it is worth. So, as as long as, you know that is statement number one, right? As people using a lot of cash, of course, it has it is very convenient. You know, it it, uh, it doesn't need uh, electricity. Uh, it's it's you know you're once you're used to it, it works. But it also uh, causes a lot of friction and and doesn't allow a lot of things to happen quickly. Specifically, with the uh, uh, pandemic. People need to stay at home. Uh, SMEs need to find different ways. So, so people are seeing, starting to see the benefit of digital money. And also, you know, money can uh, transmit the virus and stuff like that. Uh, and so there's, there's other things as well. So I think, first of all, you know, people have trust in it. But at the same time, they're also starting to see the limitations. And if you're a small SME, you know, initially you're, you're selling your street. But over time, you say the street is not big enough. So suddenly, how do I expand? And the internet is fantastic for selling stuff across the Philippines. Suddenly, you can sell something to, to somebody at the other side of the country. So I think, you know, people will have to see the value of, of digital. And when we talk about digital IDs, et cetera, uh, you know, there's, it's a flip side. You know, some people say, yeah, it's great, it's convenient. Other people say, well, you know, what about the government? You know, can I, you know, why do you want to look in my wallet? And I think there's a lot of dialogues that need to happen to build that trust to say this is this is good and it won't, you know, it, it will, will honor your privacy and all these things. So so there's a lot of dialogues that need to happen there, but I think the technologies are are not necessarily the biggest um, the hurdle. It is it is definitely to get first of all, you have to get people into the into into a system. Uh, where they can start using their money. So for many people, if you only have cash, you're not part of anything. You can't, you know. So I think that that financial inclusion, getting people to connect to their local rural bank, uh, where, where 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 they may have more trust, because they can see the branch of the bank. It kind of sounds funny, but uh, I've done a lot of digital work. But it is very important to understand that people are are trust things that are physical more than they're not physical. I mean, if you pass your branch of your bank, you know, hey, there is a branch, my money is in there, there's a person I can talk to. So it's very important when we build digital equivalents of that, that we say, what is the digital equivalent of that feeling that the, my, my money is there? So in my past career, when we built the first digital kind of bank in, 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 in Japan, the most important thing we said is, is the customer must always have access to its money and must always have see its money. So I can see my money and I can have access to it. So how we translated that was, you know, you could always see it on the internet online. You could see, here's my balance, 24 by seven, guaranteed, I can see my money. And the second thing we made sure is, is that any convenience store or any street in Japan, you could go and get your money and or deposit your money. So uh, so that that kind of thing builds builds inherent trust because that is what people worry about. Where is my money? And, and there, you know, what is this virtual thing and, and how can I trust this? So, so kind of, you know, playing back into people's mindset that is always there. And I think we're, you know, Director Joyce was talking about open banking and things like that. There are very good ways to do that because it has two main effects. One is I can aggregate my money so I can see now all my money in one place. So I can work, you know, I can have two or three accounts. It doesn't matter. But also I can show my money now to a lender and say, look, you know, I may not, I may only have hundred dollar balance, but over the last one, my cash flow is thousand dollars, and I have cash flow for the last five years. Is every month I make thousand dollars. My balance is hundred, 
And so ability to show that builds an other trust and a huge value for, for SMEs to say, now I can use my assets to get more lending and it can grow. And it's the biggest problem, you, you, Director Josh, you mentioned is lending, getting that cash to flow in the society. So, you know, know, my, know, my, uh, know your cow is just an example I use, but it is very important for people to show what they have. And a lot of SMEs are very, actually the risk in lending to small SMEs is much smaller than larger companies. Most people don't know that. They think, oh, the risk is small SME, I don't know them. Yet because you don't know them, it doesn't mean the risk is high. It is just that you don't know. So that, that open data, that connecting things together is a huge value. And that value has to be shown to people over time. They have to use it. And that trust will only be built over time. You can't just say, trust me. You know, I'm Peter. How would you trust me? You just, we just met. No, no relationship. But over time, you build trust. And I think that trust building is really, really essential to make a digital uh, success. Thanks, Peter. Transparency, accessibility, and then verifiability yes. is, is are certainly goes to work for. Uh, Director Joyce, I just want to add one more thing before you answer. I think some questions were also about how to how to you know inculcate this issue of security protection and and data privacy uh, as 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 your regulations unfold with these innovations. Uh, Director Joyce. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, just to also answer um, the issue on how do you you know, um, encourage trust in or foster trust in digital payments among unbanked so, or newly banked. So if you look at our inclusive digital finance pillars, um, it's digital, but it's actually anchored on uh, expansive access of cash in and cash out points. So that, that can sound counterintuitive to some because we're saying we were promoting digital, but how come your inclusive digital finance pillar is built on cash out, cash and cash out network, and that's part of building trust. As Peter mentioned, you know, um, when we transition the unbanked from cash based to digital payment transaction, they need to know that there's a, a cash out point nearby that they can where they can readily, you know, cash out their digital wallet, and these cash out points are not only accessible in terms of uh, you know, distance, um, they're, they, they're also emotionally accessible for these low income individuals. You know, they're not intimidating, unlike a formal branch when, where they feel they need to dress up. So for low income individuals, uh, cash out points that can be their neighborhood retail outlets are very uh, emotionally accessible. And that also helps build trust into uh, the formal um, use of accounts. And the first, another way that we're promoting, um, you know, onboarding individuals is really supporting the um, promotion of compelling uses of a transaction account. So for instance, um, we've worked with the Department of Labor and Employment uh, to encourage employers to use transaction accounts for payment of wages. There's a lot of um, wage earners in the Philippines that continue to receive their salaries through cash. So uh, the labor um, uh, department has already issued that advisory encouraging. So really um, creating that compelling use, so, uh, compelling use case for opening an account and that once they have opened an account, um, then we ask them to use it uh, for digital payments and for our encur to encourage them to use it for digital payments that also needs that we we need to uh, promote uh, digital payments acceptance by smaller merchants. So vendors in the wet markets, um, the tricycle drivers. So that's part of the work that uh, we're also doing um, in coordination with other government agencies. And of course, um, uh, continue, we can't really talk about um, um, you know, digital, I, we can talk about all these financial inclusion initiatives without talking about FILSIS, uh, the digital ID. That will really be, uh, we think, a game changer uh, because that will make client acquisition from the point of view of the financial service providers that can make really client acquisition uh, very cost efficient. And that can also lead them to tap into markets that uh, they have traditionally ignored because of, you know, perceived cost and perceived low margin. Um, so, so those are just some of the things that I wish to, sh to share on that um, yeah, issue. Thank you, Dr. Joyce. I mean, I think if you, if you think about this issue of building trust, 
uh, factoring security, having people migrate towards that goal of being 70% backed is a system. I think we're certainly along that virtuous circle and, 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 and network effect to get that. A lot more needs to be done, but I think with a greater interaction between the public private sector, with the regulators and these innovations that you're fostering under the leadership of, of, of Gardner Jok, I think we're well on our way to doing that. So uh, with that, I would like to say thank you, uh, uh, Peter Franken and Director Ellen Joyce Sufiancia. Thank you so much for your time and the robust discussion. Thank you so much.